Thank you so very much, Lucinda and Sarah and the Norwich Public Library and the Norwich Historical Society and Jacob and all of Vermont Humanities. It's really, really a pleasure to be here. And thank all of you for coming. My name is Judy Chalmer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'll be doing a little bit more of an introduction, but I too have just a few odds and ends that I think will be helpful first. I'll be the person who will kind of move us through the conversation. And I know that we can't see you and you can't see each other, but we know you're there. And we are so glad that you're there. Um, we know that you're, you, that you're here from various places, from your homes or other places from potentially anywhere in the world. And we know that some of you are gonna be watching this recording afterwards. So we're glad that all of you are there and here. And just to create just to create as much community as we possibly can with every piece of information we can, we can tell you that we are our group size is uh, attending tonight is about 50 people. So let's get cozy with our 50ness. And um, I would just want to invite you to be comfortable in whatever room you're in, whatever clothes you're wearing, you can get up, you can sit down, you can lie down, you can stim, you can close your eyes, you can make noise. Let's use this space that we have together to be fully ourselves. So use the chat box anytime. If you are uh, unable to use the chat box, I'm going to spell out Jacob's um, email address for you. Uh, and because you can also email him with questions and comments if you can't use the chat. It's J Pelletier, all one word, J P E L L E T I E R at vermonthumanities.org. And Vermont Humanities is all one word with no caps or spaces. So, our agenda for this evening is that we will all introduce ourselves and then we are going to read poems in honor of Deborah Lisi Baker, who is going to be with us and read her own poems and be part of this conversation tonight and whose loss we mourn with our community very, very deeply. I will say a little bit more about that when we get to that section but each of us then will read a poem. Um, of after, after we read our poems in tribute to Deborah, each of us will read another of our poems. And after each poem, we will have a conversation about things within the poem or things the poem brings to mind. And please, and then we'll, at the end, we'll have time for some questions and answers. And please just jot down your questions as we go. So with that, I'm going to begin by a little bit more uh, introduction of myself and then invite Eli and Toby to do likewise. So I am a light-skinned older woman with short gray hair and brown eyes, blue rim glasses. I've got lots of wrinkles and blotches and I'm wearing um, a black turtleneck. Uh, and you can see behind me the sort of burnt orange top of a futon that I'm sitting on in a blank white wall behind me. Um, identity pieces that are salient tonight. I'm queer, disabled, a poet, and I'm very happily a board member of Vermont Humanities. So um, it just tickled that you're here. So Eli. So, hello, I'm Eli Claire. I am a white, transmasculine person. I use he, him, they, them pronouns. I have red, ugly hair. I'm wearing a black um, T-shirt with a green um, rock on a leather string around my neck. And in the background 
is a purple bedroom with various things on the wall. And I, I come here as a queer, disabled, gender queer poet, activist, tree and rock lover. I'm really happy to be here and grateful for all the labor that has made this event possible. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. Toby. Hello. My name is Toby McNutt. My pronouns are they, them. I am a short, broad-shouldered white person. I have a short, dark beard and no real hair left on top anymore. Um, I'm wearing a rainbow rimmed glasses and big silver headphones, as well as a dark shirt and a knitted vest. I am on my teal couch in my living room with a neutral wall behind me and a mirror showing some incoherent reflections of the rest of the space. Um, I am here also as a trans masculine and non-binary person, um, as a queer person, a um, disabled person whose disability fluctuates over time, um, as well as an autistic person. Um, and I am a poet as well as being a textile artist and a dancer and choreographer, all of which tend to wiggle into my work in one way or another. And I'm very excited to have the chance to put my work in this particular context together is really exciting for me. Thank you. So I wanna talk a little bit about Deborah. Deborah Lisi Baker, say her full name. We know that many of you have your own memories of Deborah. She was a person whose presence was so loving and so strong that no matter how little or how well you knew her, she left behind a connection that was genuine and caring. Tonight's tribute um, isn't a kind of resume-based tribute. We know that there'll be others who will tell very, very rich stories about Deborah's advocacy, her mentoring, her organizational leadership, her friendship, her love of her family. Um, tonight, as disabled poets ourselves, we're remembering and honoring Deborah as a poet and someone who is deeply connected to the natural world. And so what we'd like to do, I'm going to read one of her poems and um, then each of us is going to read one of ours and that in some way responds to either our experience of Deborah or, of, or to her poem or to this event tonight at which she was going to be so present and, um, and so highly valued. Um, we may or may not say a few words as well, but mainly we want our poems to speak, our poems to, and to remain in conversation with her as, um, as we had hoped that she would be here um, physically uh, tonight, engaged with her life of poetry. So the poem I'm going to read, Deborah's poem, is called Waking. In the morning, she turns over on her pain and finds it intact. Each morning is the same, like finding the same stone mysteriously renewed beneath her blankets, though she hadn't meant it to be there. She places great boughs of holly over the windowsills and doors, but in the morning, the stone is still there, always. At night, the sheets, smooth and cool to her touch, long and loose like a cloth pond, and upon waking, the stone. Where does it come from? How is it spawned? What does it matter? The stone, small and grand, nestles at the root of her spine, spreads out, tracing a vast foundation, as though her body is changing, metamorphosing, and in the spring, an immense statue of some older womanish thing will be found, an altered form, half wild, half
half stone and altogether immovable. At Christmas, she chanted, half sang Hail Mary's The Lord's Prayer and an ancient benediction for travelers. So, Toby, would you read a poem? I am going to read to you an unpublished poem. Um, the title it has in the access document is Rituals. Um, rituals are one of the conversations we were incubating with Deborah as we planned this event. So, Rituals. One the ritual of cold nights. In the dark of the moon, eat one seed for each long lost once lover, red and bittersweet in the darkness on the tongue. Two, the ritual of cold water. Lower her body into the river, its current known to take away the pain. She screams as the water boils from its effort. Three, the ritual of cold words is unwritten. Four, the ritual of cold bones. On a salt-crusted stone, on a bed of bruised and weeping leaves, on the ground, below the ground, press embers into the hollows of my body, and I will rise. Thank you. Eli. So I'm going to read a poem that I started early in the, the pandemic and finished after some, after a beloved leader and activist in disability community died in May of 2020. And one of the things that's true about Deborah's death is this experience of foreshortened life and sudden death is, is one of the experiences that defines disability community. And I was so thinking of that, that I wrote this poem called Heartbreak. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Heart of lake of flood level. Heart of stone. Heart of pine. Heart of glacier collapsing. Heart of spasm and spin and stim. Heart of river no longer reaching its estuary. Heart of scientist working to create a vaccine for which the whole world is waiting. Heart of hummingbird, hive, hay barn, heart of octopus and damselfly, heart of ER nurse after a 16 hour shift, heart of thunderhead, heart of apple tree, heart of janitor cleaning rooms of the newly dead heart of queerness, heart of no justice, no peace, heart of rook and pawn placed on a chessboard, heart of falcon nesting atop a skyscraper, heart of tightrope walker at 2 a.m., heart of dance floor disco ball drag queen after one too many whiskey, Sours, heart of Black Lives Matter, heart of snake, mouse, owl, heart of bedrock, heart of treehouse, heart of grief, heart of jet stream, heart of moon, heart of sand hill crane, heart of rumble, heart of rage, heart of hallucination, heart of hardness, heart of slowness, Heart of worry, heart of orgasm, heart of gasping for breath, heart of ventilator, heart quivering, heart stumbling, heart beginning to stop, beginning to break, beginning to rise. Thank you. Thank you. 
my poem uh, is about grief, and it is titled, After My Sister Dies, I Practice Animal Tracking. I'm going to give you just a quick verbal description of how it appears on the page because I think it'll help as you listen. This is a series of short disconnected images and they're separated on the page, reminiscent of the way animal tracks might appear or memories. And I'll pause briefly in between them. After my sister dies, I practice animal tracking. A bare branch cleanly nipped less than an inch thick, left where it fell. Slabs of bark tossed to the ground, steadfast effort alone in the night. Under the tipped tree, could be porcupine, it's a mess. How long ago did you sit here? Now anyone can see. You don't mind that I'm here? Near the condo, smooth bark bitten sideways. I remember corn on the cob. Deep woods, steady prints. Why only here am I content with the past? Knowing so little. I explain everything I can, slowing everyone way down. Loping, three prints, curved line. Why am I still surprised to learn things that you did? The bright tips of the claws, a starburst up the trunk. All those years I didn't look. Double prints. Something bounding away, its soft body just clearing the snow. Thank you. And I hope that that tribute to Deborah conveys some of the ways that we treasured the time we had to plan with her and share poems together. So now we're gonna move into the next section of what we're gonna to do tonight. Um, and I'd like to start by asking Eli to read a poem and then we'll have a conversation. So my body is radically shaped and defined by tremoring of lots of kinds. Every part of my body tremors. And I have written about my tremoring body for 30 years, probably. And I've just started thinking about the way tremors exist everywhere in the world, both the human-made world and the more than human world. And so I'm, I'm going to read one of these poems about tremors in the world and chose this partly because of Deborah's poem about stone, because this is also about stone. And we were having this deep, deep email exchange about stone as well as ritual. So this is called Tremors Planet. Your tremoring hands and mine. Remember how tectonic plates yearn for friction, heat, that long jolting rub of rock against rock, and yet hold still still till they can no longer bear the stillness. Remember dolomite scraping over shale, careen and shake, become glass flexing, plates rattling, walls cracking. 
become lurch thrust creek. Thank you. So Toby, what's on your mind as you hear that poem? I'm still part of me is having this unfinished conversation about stone um, and the way that we have approached stone as something other than a cold or inert or immovable obstacle of an object, but as this more um, mobile, warm, fleshly component that we have this different relationship to this hard thing that I've really appreciated. Um, and as well, something that I've noticed in Eli's work that I'm wondering if you'd like to talk about Eli is the level of integration with the natural world really strikes me as not just being a part of the natural world, but claiming of space as being the natural world, that we are not, we are a small part, but we are also the whole thing, which I love. And I am wondering if you're in the same perspective or if it's something you'd like to talk about at all. As you ask that, Toby, I think of a couple of things. I think about the ways the net, the ways the more than human world. And I say it that way because I think that this distinction between natural world and human world is a way of separating the two, and I don't think there's separation. The other than human world has always been refuge for me. And refuge because as a disabled kid who had a really visible disability, his disability led into every space I was in. And, and as a kid um, and as an adult, being harassed and gawked at for all the difference contained visibly in my body that the, the, the other than the human world provided so much refuge for me and provided the reflection of how different, different beings were. Uh, there wasn't uniformity, that there weren't averages, that there wasn't better bodies and worse bodies, there weren't disposable bodies and valuable bodies that I learned in the more than human world about body variation in itself being necessary. And in that learning, I, I learned that I was one tiny connected piece of that difference between beings. And, and finally, I learned that there's so much magic in the other than human world, so much that science by itself doesn't explain. Science being incredibly important. The field guides naming different beings as distinct is really important, but there is so much magic beyond and through and among that science. So Toby, that's not an answer to your question, but those, those, are, the, those are some of the pieces that this question provokes for me. So thank you so much for the provocation. And my apologies for the lack of answer. It's only kind of a question, so I think we're pretty even on that one. More of an observation. Um, that makes sense, though, as well. I've noticed in some of the work you've shared with us, 
of the four of us, you're the most likely to use literal species and like literal parts of the physical world that we know and live in. Um, and here it's really neat to hear that context for it, for what sort of ecology it has meant to you. And just to add a detail to that, the poem I just read was written after spending many, many hours at the thrust pod on my plane that's out at the end of Rock Point. So it's as specific as that. And like I take so much joy in learning an ecosystem well enough that I can begin to ground images in that ecosystem. And there's some limitations to that. There are some limitations to connecting my work so specifically, and there are strengths to it. I, it's not like my pension for getting really connected to specific ecosystems isn't the right way or the wrong way to write about the northern human world. It's just one way of doing that. And Matt's is a belief that the specificities of our disabled body minds is really important. And the specificities from the inside out, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. And by specificity, I don't mean our diagnoses at all. The diagnoses are useful, but they're often from the outside. In. And so along with the ecosystem specificity, I really believe in the specificity of our body minds. Mm. I had, you know, another uh, question for you, Eli. Um, in the poem, there's a lot about friction and becoming. Um, and it just makes me think about the edges of being the edges of bodies and what it means to to think about our bodies in the world and the you know um there are ways in which we're porous and we're constantly taking things in and things breathing out and i just wonder if you have things to say about what the edge of being the edge of a being might be like, or the edge of a body. That's such a big question, Judy. We could rewind this whole hour and talk about edges, right? Edges is another theme. Let me suggest edges as a theme for, a, for an event of this nature at some point. Um, the four of us, again, this really plentiful email conversation we were having before in preparation for this event, we saw we're talking about how all of our work blurred the edges, blurred the edges between human and and other than human, blurred the edges between magic, supernatural, and natural blurred and so there's su such a way in which while acknowledging edges I also want to acknowledge the blur the blurring of edges that all three of us um work with one of the features of ableism to, to kind of pivot to another kind of reflection based on that conversation. And the, uh, one of the features of ableism, and very briefly, ableism is the system of oppression that targets disabled, mad, deaf, neurodivergent, um, and chronically ill people, and people assume to be disabled, whether, whether or not 
disabled, assumed to be disabled. One of the features of ableism is to draw really distinct edges between bodies that are seen, body minds that are seen as wrong and bad and disposable, and body minds that it might be better to be dead than living with a body mind like that. And ableism draws really distinct lines between disabled body minds and not disabled body minds. Um, and I think the internal experience of those edges is really different from the external reflection of you're other, you're not us, we want you to go away, you're not in our imagined. Another feature of ableism is this belief that disabled people are not in an uh, imagined long for liberty for a feature, that disability doesn't exist in that feature. And I think all of our work presses back against those ableist edges and those ableist, the beliefs behind those ableist edges. And the queer ones as well. You know, we are a group of queer folks um, and that's not technically the focus of what we're doing here, but guess what? It also is um, and very much that sense of blurred edges I think applies. Yeah, thank you. So Toby, um, I must, with regret of, because we think we could talk about Eli's poem easily all night, but um, also anticipation of Toby's. Toby, would you please read your poem next? Yes. I'm going to read you a poem called How I Lost the Sky. Uh, and to set the stage for this one a little bit, um, I am mostly a speculative poet. So I write work that specifically aims to be fantasy or science fiction or uh, non-realistic genre poetry. Um, so the supernatural is my, is my home in a lot of ways. Um, and I ended up there and end up there on an ongoing basis because the more I try to write literally about that internal detailed experience, the more speculative it becomes. And this is one of those poems. Um, this poem was first published. When were you first published? Uh, 2016 or 17. Um, it has also appeared in um, Murmuration's Dance, site-specific work when women were birds, um, which put it into a gender mythology light that was really interesting. Um, and now we get to look at it through the disability lens, which I'm excited about. But let's read the poem. How I Lost the Sky. I remember when impatient down at last gave way to strong shoulders, when envy and pale fancy were set aside for shrieking, whirling games in rich wind riffled colors. I remember broad, lazy buzzard circles, the silent stalking of owls, entire congregations of us wheeling like a hive mind, flocking, murmurating. I remember freedom. I remember the day the wind wouldn't hold me anymore. It faltered. I felt it rise the way it should and pass me by untouching. As breath failed in my lungs, it returned, holding, buoying, and I circled and climbed. I was still flying, but the wind the wind had dropped me, and in that moment, I knew I had lost the sky. I told no one. 
I gathered myself, arranged my plumage, preened and shining one last time. I stretched out long, slender albatross wings and leapt from the cliff's edge one last time. The sea wind racing up the rock face made all its usual enticements, liberty, seduction, if you come with me. I would have it keep its promises while I could still hear them, just one last time. Far off over a dark sea, I sought and seized a storm cell, not to court its lightnings, not to dance between its raindrops, not to steal away its bruising purples for twilight feathers, no longer. I drove hard amidst the thunderclaps to the silence at its heart where the wind chokes on its own tail, suffocates. As I passed beyond the last living wind, it did not whisper to me, not one apology, not one last caress. I fell. I dove, falcon sleek, dropping faster than a hailstone. I plummeted from one silence to a deeper one, and its darkness filled my ears and nose and mouth. The sea currents tumbled me till I could no longer remember where the sky had gone. I had not known the sea, no more than to stroke her surface perhaps brush shoulders here and there. I had the sky, how should I have known? She picked my locks, her rippling fingers rotted free my worthless waterlogged feathers, slicked my skin, golden eagle eyes clouded and bleached to silver, leaching color into her dark depths. I shimmer now, I am a lithe thing, curving more smoothly than any thermal. And on clear nights, little glowing, rising plankton reflect against the surface in a slow dance of glittering lights, twice as many stars as any sky. Thank you. So Eli, what comes to mind for you? To be that poem so makes me think there, there I'm trying to choose between two, two thoughts. It poem so makes me think about the line remembering freedom and the role of poetry the role of disability poetry in the role of queer disability poetry, the role of poetry that dreams other worlds. And your, your, your poetry, your work, your poetry and your dance so dreams other worlds. And the line remembering Freedom makes me think about the role of poetry and art in remembering freedom. And the the question for you is how do you carry this idea and image of remembering freedom with you as you write? And if so, how do you carry it with you? What are what are the what are the ways you carry that weight, that lightness, that imagination, that desire? Um, yeah. Another one we could do a whole talk about. I do carry it, though. Sometimes it feels so distant that that is where the work goes instead of how to be when it's, when freedom seems far away. But in both my poetry and in my dance work, things start with sensation. And in poetry, particularly, 
And the reason I end up in speculative poetry so often is that I write with the belief of a world where this sensation is a part of things. And it, it is, and I live here in this world and my sensation is a part of it, but thinking of the question of suspension of disbelief a lot. So how do I invoke a world where my body mind experience can be believed in the same way if I were writing a sci-fi novel that you'd be like, yeah, the cars can fly here. That's, we understand that that's how this world works. It's baked into how the experience is given to you. And I try, I try for that a lot to take that nugget of a physical feeling or an emotional feeling or a sensation that exists somewhere in embodiment and let it grow into a world where it is free, where it's, where it's a part of full expression. I think if that answers your question. Thank you. And for interest of time, I won't like respond immediately with a dozen things I'm thinking and wondering right now. Oh, just respond with one of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> Too, too delicious. Um, well, I'm just going to take a, give us a couple minutes then to just um, talk, just say that the lushness in your imagery, Toby, is so, um, it's just a delicious experience. And it's lushness in, ter- in, in the context of loss. So, um, I think and write in, about loss a lot. And um, so I'm sort of wondering, it's about how do you hold the, the hugeness of feeling, the hugeness of experience at all, you know, and in a poem and um, how does inventing worlds um, make that possible. Yeah. Um, I've, I also write about loss a lot and I've struggled with how I want to do so, uh, as a disabled person and as a trans person, I had a bunch of guilt early on when I started trying to address loss, um, about whether, it would play into people's beliefs about disability, particularly as being a loss and lesser reductive process. Um, And ultimately concluded that we have to be allowed to have grief and that grief isn't mutually exclusive from pride or from pleasure. Um, And Queer stuff helped me figure some of that out, that pride's opposite, if it can be said to have one, is shame, not grief. Grief is its other, is another entity, and it can it can be there. And it, if it is, you should see it. Uh, you should you should have to know it, notice it. But one of the things poetry and speculative poetry lets me have is loss that transforms in a more literal way. I've written so many times, I will write a poem, I'll look and be like, oh, look, I did it again. Um, I keep coming back to it where by surrendering to the experience of the loss, something new can happen. Um, And that comes back to what I was saying about the more literally I write about my experiences, the more speculative they become. So this poem follows much more closely than people would guess my transition into understanding myself as a disabled person, which felt like giving up. It felt like a loss. It felt like a brokenness. 
the first thing I lost to changes in my body was the sky. My dad is a hang glider pilot. I grew up around flying and flight. I have flown without a motor and it's amazing. And that was the first thing that changed was my body couldn't do that anymore. Um, and figuring out how to talk about that moment took decades <laughs> afterwards. But that sense of there was this loss and that feeling of, I guess that's it, that's the end. But once I could understand myself in the light of, oh, I exist in a disabled body mind, this is where I'm at. I had permission to look after myself. I had permission to find new ways to be. I could be in my body and my mind in new ways that were magical. Um, and I may not fly anymore, though now I'm an aerialist, so I've got some sky back. So that's, that's also nice. Um, but water holds my body and particularly with the way uh, my joints work and the instabilities and spasms in my body. Water is one of the only places I can rest truly. So becoming a water creature was, again, a somewhat literal step on that path. But being able to sculpt this world where that transformation is real and tangible and visible and all these ways other than not just a tiny thing inside has been uh, really important to me. Mm. Thank you. And may I just add one thing about loss? I think that disabled people have a lot to teach the world. We have a lot of wisdom about body-mind loss that does not become all-encompassing, that does not lead to tragedy, does not mean the end of full and plentiful lives, but in the great body-mind loss in um, and the, I, I just think there's a plenty of knowledge among disabled people in the in disability community collectively about reframing loss as something to be overcome or something to be seen as tragic. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I am going to read my poem, which is another poem about animal tracking and loss. Um, I um, am really interested in animal tracking and not in a sort of as a predator, but uh, as in a way of engaging in story and wonder. My disability uh, means that I can't follow animal tracks away from a human path without a guide. And so in a certain sense, this poem is about not following tracks. Certain tracks I don't follow. They're not even traceable, not really, or not by me. They crossed mine when I was lost in cavernous need. I never stopped, for instance, to ask what you thought, knowing so well the unwelcome path to your death. Now there's nothing to follow, not you, not a root through the dark, not a mole underground, not a knuckle of the root, now above, now below, not a current in a pond, not a loon spluttered up, choked with love to the surface, and another's life pierced for its chick. A book recommends I ask myself how I'm different after my loss. But there wasn't a time when death didn't dangle its just over here. It's cruel once you were loved. It's why not keep looking? I've counted to 20 slowly. I've yet to be found. Last night outside my window, a fox barked on and off for an hour, arguing disbelief at the silent lift of the owl. 
I don't follow how we fall from our lives or maybe just float off and the sadness hovers over that spot. I can't find the scent. I can't find the spot. By instinct, I find I'm lost. So, um, I guess, um, Toby, do you have a question about that? I should have re-looked up my questions before we got started, but I have... I will go with this question. I'm curious about, as we've seen it in a few pieces of yours, the connection between loss in the emotional sense and being literally lost in the woods. Yeah. Um, and if, um, and what your experience of being in the literal woods is. Do you feel lost in the woods? Do you feel at home in the woods? What is, where is sort of your emotional balance between the place and the feeling and the action? Yeah, those are all great questions. Um, you know, it's um, the disability that I have is invisible and it was invisible to me in the sense that um, it was never, I, I'm, old enough that it was never identified um, when I was a child. So I just kind of grew up ashamed of being lost. Um, so I think that one of the attractions for me about, in particular, tracks is this, is first of all, that they're intermittent. And second of all, that they mirror in some way um, well, it, it's all about navigation and the complexity of navigation for me. Um, I'm, I'm, because most of what I see in terms of tracking is the intersection of my own human tracks with other than human beings. Um, that is marvelous to me. That is, um, it's marvelous to me because I feel um, granted something. I feel uh, that it's, it's a glimpse. Um, it's a story piece that I can take part in and be part of. I'm very aware of being tracked um, by animals. You know, when I, the other week I was walking in, in Red Rocks Park and a, and, a, and a fox stopped and looked at me. You know, or one time I was escorted out of Red Rocks by an owl who I presume was trying to lure me away from a nest. But I'm so aware of being tracked. It's not human-centered necessarily. Um, I am you know, and to answer your question sort of emotionally in the woods, I feel most at home. I think I really resonated with what Eli had to say about what you learn about from natural spaces. They're um, so affirming of um, multiplicity. They're so affirming of all the processes, you know, for various reasons in my own life of having experienced deaths in my early chi you know, childhood, I'm really, really aware of death. And so um, it's just in the, op you know, it's everything, the whole process of life and change is there. Um, and I feel very much at home. I'm also afraid. So, um, but I, in some ways I feel like that combination of fear and um, gratitude is awe. You know, I don't feel sovereign. I don't, I don't feel, yeah. Yeah. As a human, I mean, I don't feel sovereign, if you know what I mean. Um, so I'm drawn, very much drawn to that. And poetry 
for me also, I feel like I, even you can see it, it, it for the, for those of you um, who are uh, here, I'm using my hands a lot and, and kind of in a sort of choppy way, kind of demonstrating that a lot of my um, way of being in the world is bit by bit by bit by bit. It's a disconnected bit, as you've heard in the poems. So for poetry and its availability as non-standard grammar is also, I feel identified with it. And you can hear it in my speech. I sometimes start sentences and don't finish them. It's, um, it's piecemeal. That's a long answer. <laughs> I will also add for folks who are listening to the poems, but not looking at the access copies that that has been true of the poems you've shared with us, that they tend to be structured on the page in that sort of uh, interspersed way more so than the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I am really aware that we, have just passed the eight o'clock mark. And I know that um, questions have just been solicited. So, um, but I don't know if there are um, any questions or comments that Jacob, you'd like to re rejoin us and lead us through. Yeah, overall, I just want to say thank you again for sharing your work and those reflections. Um, we haven't had any direct questions from our participants, but just some um, some really great comments by people like Daryl, who said, thanks for exploring the, the sense of loss and the wisdom you bring to experiencing its process. And, um, and this person, the fairy tale apothecary says, I, I truly hope this, that this will be a start to many more of these conversations. So beautifully, tenderly inspiring. Thank you. So, and I feel the same way. And just thank you again for taking this time this evening to spend with us and share this. Well, it's really been um, so much fun to be in conversation. And um, I'm just grateful and want to give an opportunity to Eli and Toby to for last thoughts before we sign off. Something we haven't talked about, but I would feel I would, it would feel like a big absence if I didn't acknowledge what it means to be a white person and to be a white person descended from settlers um, seeking refuge, seeking freedom, seeking solace and, and writing from inside the more than human world, that as a white person directly descended from settlers, like I'm doing that on land that was stolen, that I have lived in places where the land was unceded land. I've lived on land where I have roots that are only one generation deep on that land, if that. And that means that I, as a white person, have a really specific responsibility to the history of the indigenous people who have steward, stewarded the land in the places I've lived and who are still here today, still, still here, whether on their homeland or making home in on other land that I have accountability and responsibility in my activist life, in my personal life, and then my life as a poet to my fundamental relationship to, to land and indigenous people. Um, 
And and again, if we wanted to rewind this hour to talk about the ways disability and queerness and indigenous life on the this on Turtle Island and the ways in which colonial settlerism has um, always worked to erase and replace indigenous people and indigenous people have have always and continue to resist that liberation um, replaced and, and resisted in like manly, manly ways. And I don't know, I would love to rewind the, this hour and find out and talk about the connections between those pieces as they relate to the more than human world. Um, so I guess my last word is a soapbox and the polemic, and that is so fitting in terms of who I am as a writer. Yeah, I would also love to have that conversation. I think one of the questions you asked me over email was about that relationship in the particular context of people finding meaning in tr and transformation in the land and in creatures and both in the sense of how can we do so respectfully but with all of the historical lenses on it about how who is human and who is an animal and where is the line between those things is fraught but we don't get to rewind this hour. So we'll have, we'll have to do it again sometime. Um, and that's, I think my closing thought would be the chance to have this sort of rich context of each other from the inside has been so valuable to, to me that it's not an editor sitting somewhere pulls out a selection of poems and ta-da, it's a disability selection, but that we we're in dialogue of what did we want to talk about? How did we not want to talk about it? What poems? I send you some poems. You send me some poems. We exchange and there's room for growth and development has been so gratifying and fulfilling, rare. And that I also wish we could do more of. I also want to say a big thank you to our ASL interpreters because interpreting poetry is hard. So thank you all so much uh, for doing uh, the hard work with our words. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, I um, also think in terms of, you know, more opportunity and thinking about Deborah, you know, the whole question of access in the natural world is something that Deborah was very, very involved in and um, is um, a huge, big topic in and of itself. Um, and what the natural world is, is a huge topic in, in and of itself. So, so much to, so much for all of us to take with us as we leave and take leave of each other tonight. Um, so I just want to end with being thankful, very, very thankful to Toby and Eli for being such wonderful conversationalists and, um, partners in this great uh, beginning and um, to Jacob and to Sarah and to Lucinda and all of the interpreters and all of you who are, who are, who are here. Um, and um, it's just been a pleasure. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you everyone again. And I think the big testament is that the discussions don't end here. So I look forward to the next time we get to continue this discussion or find new ones and find each other online or in the real world soon. So thank you all and have a great night.